Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, happy Easter, and uh, it's certainly good to be in God's house today, and uh, we want to welcome everyone, and uh, we want to thank you for coming and being with us today and join us for Easter Sunday, and uh, we're looking forward to what God has in store for this service today, and uh, we just want to encourage everybody that will uh, just to get in here and mind the Lord this morning and worship Him today through song and through the preaching of God's Word and uh, we're going to have uh, some good music this morning from our choir and some specials. And then about midpoint uh, through the service today, we're going to be taking up the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And uh, 100% of that offering goes to uh, support missionaries uh, through the North American Mission Board that are serving uh, throughout the country and spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. So uh, just be much in prayer for today and remember the service as we pray. And if you're visiting with us, uh, there are there's a guest card uh, in the bulletin. And if you'd like to take just a few minutes and fill that out, you can place that in the offering plate on your way out this, uh, this morning. So uh, we want to uh, just encourage you today, pray for the songs today that are sung, and uh, just mind the Lord. So I'm going to ask Brother Hunter, if he will, this morning to come and uh, lead us today in music. Oh 
Lord for that good singing this morning and appreciate that. Uh, at this time, we're uh, going to uh, take up our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And uh, Cheryl, we have a video we're going to play. So uh, as uh, we play that video, we encourage you this morning just to give out of obedience to what God has laid on your heart and uh, lead you to give today. Newfoundland is called the rock because life here is hard. We're an island off the east coast of Canada, and from a, a spiritual perspective, it's mind-boggling how little churches there are. You know, my, my parents are from Newfoundland. My whole heritage is from here. And so we moved back to, uh, to Newfoundland because it's a fantastic place to plant a church. When I first came to Newfoundland, I remember sitting on my couch praying and just feeling so sad that people that I didn't even know, <laughs> I hadn't even met them yet, but they had no chance to hear the gospel. We are here in Kilbride and there's a lot of young families here. And in 1892, the, the last church existed in Kilbride. It burnt down in 1892. Uh, and so the gospel hasn't been preached here in 128 years. And so we set out to have people in our home because there's a term called CFA, come from away. If you're born on the mainland or anywhere else but Newfoundland and you move here, you will always be known as a come from away. So we had to adjust our mindset and say, we are moving to Newfoundland and we are going to let God work we know that that's probably going to be a long process. We are seeing the gospel transforming people, but still when we are gathering on Sundays, I'm always reminded of how outnumbered we are. If I were to get in a car and drive two hours south, you won't find a single Bible preaching, gospel-centered evangelical church. And so it's the rock because it's, it's very hard to plant seeds here. But, Lord, <laughs> here I am, send me. Amen. All righty. We definitely want to continue to remember all of our missionaries that are serving through North American Mission Board, and we've been praying for them uh, continually over the last month. So we encourage you to continue to pray for them as God is using them to uh, spread the gospel throughout the, the United States of America and North America. Uh, God is uh, using these men and women, these families, greatly. So we want to continue to pray for them. Uh, I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, and then after that I encourage everybody that can and will just to come forward this morning. And uh, there's a big old Easter egg right down front. And uh, you can drop your offering for the Annie Armstrong Easter offering this morning in this Easter egg. And uh, as we said, 100% of that's going to go to support these missionaries that are serving throughout North America. And so let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. God, we just thank you, Lord, for what this day represents. And we thank you, Father, most of all for the resurrection. And Father, knowing that the resurrection that we have in you, Lord Jesus, is our hope. And that our hope will carry us through, Father, to one of these days when you return. And Father, we're looking forward to that return, Father, knowing that, Lord, that return could be at any, any day, in any moment that it's imminent, and we thank you for that. We pray this morning, Father, that, Lord, you would bless all the missionaries in North America, Father, that are serving through the North American Mission Board that we've been praying for. And we ask and we pray today that, Father, you would help us, Lord, to be obedient, Lord, to give uh, out of a joyful heart and give out of obedience, Father. And, Lord, as we give today, we pray that, God, you would just take this offering Use it for your kingdom, your honor and glory, that, God, it would further the gospel. And, Lord, not only, Father, in our giving, Lord, today, but, Father, we pray this morning that, Father, if there are young men or young women or middle-aged men or women or older men and women, Father, that are in our church that, Lord, you've been speaking to, that you've been dealing with, that, Lord, you've been calling. And, Father, Lord, that you are leading, Lord, into missions and, God, to go and to serve you. I pray that, Lord, they would. Father, I pray that, Lord, they would answer that call, they would surrender that call, and that, Father, you would take them and that they would step out in faith, Lord, in obedience to you and use them for your kingdom, your honor, and your glory. Lord, we love you in all this. 
We ask in your name, amen. Amen. At this time, you may bring your offering. say this morning I'm so thankful for all that the Lord's done for me in the name of this song here I owe him everything
we owe the Lord everything, don't we? And uh, we could never begin to be able to repay the Lord uh, for what he's done for us and the, the willingness of the sacrifice that he made uh, for us on the cross of Calvary. But I, I know this morning, uh, the best we could do is to give our lives to the Lord and surrender our heart, surrender our life to the service and to the work of the Lord. And uh, I believe that with all my heart this morning that if we can do that and uh, just follow the Lord Jesus, uh, my friend, I believe we can honor him today in the way that we try our best to live our life, amen, and to spread the gospel of our Lord and as our Savior. Uh, it's certainly good to be here this morning, and uh, we are so thankful that you are here. And I'll say that again, uh, but I really mean that this morning. It is good to be in God's house, and especially good to be in God's house on Easter Sunday, isn't it? And uh, I'm so thankful for the privilege and the opportunity that we can uh, come together, that we can meet, that we can gather, and uh, that we can worship Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords this morning, uh, for what he done for us on the cross of Calvary. We looked at the cross of Calvary on Friday night in our Good Friday service, and um, we, uh, we are, uh, the cross was our focus on Friday night. And uh, we looked at how Jesus made atonement uh, for our sin, and uh, we, we are know tonight that we have been justified through our Wednesday night studies, uh, through our articles of faith. We studied this past Wednesday night on justification. And uh, we know this evening that according to God's word, or this morning, I'm sorry, according to God's word, we're justified uh, by the blood of Jesus Christ. And uh, our faith and our belief is accounted unto righteousness, and uh, it is by Jesus and his blood this morning that we are justified. Today, uh, I'd like to look at a couple of verses this morning, and uh, we're going to begin with uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. And uh, if you've been with us on Sunday morning, you know that we've been going through the book of 1 Thessalonians. And uh, I had to uh, just look in there this week as I begin to read and prepare and pray and study. And uh, in God's providence this week, I just think I marvel once again of how good God is and how God orchestrates everything. Uh, there's nothing by chance. There's nothing just by happen. Uh, but God has a perfect plan. And uh, I want to look at the verse uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, verse number 16, to start out this morning. And uh, I don't believe it's any coincidence today that this is where we are in our study of 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, verse 16, where we've left off. And that one verse today is this, as the Apostle Paul wrote to the church of Thessalonica, and verse 16 says, Rejoice evermore. Amen? Rejoice evermore. Uh, maybe you're, uh, maybe in some versions uh, that you read, you may have the CSB or the ESV or the New King James Version. And all those versions say this, rejoice always. My friend, it doesn't matter if it's evermore or always, it is the same today. And what God and what Apostle Paul is reminding the church there is that we can rejoice, can't we? Uh, for you and I that have been saved by God's amazing and wonderful day, uh, grace, today is a great day of rejoicing for you and I. Uh, we can rejoice today because of the resurrection, can't we? Uh, look at a couple of things here. The Lord has reminded us just speaking on this verse. Uh, we can rejoice today, and I'm reminded that our joy in, in the Lord, our rejoicing and our joy in God today, it should not fluctuate on our circumstances or our feelings, should it? No. Uh, but for you and I, as Paul writes and he reminds them, commands them, that we are to rejoice always, to rejoice evermore. Uh, I believe what Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4, verse number 4, he reminded of this, and he said, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Uh, church, you and I today, our ultimate joy comes in dwelling with, with, from, the, from Jesus Christ that dwells in us, doesn't it? Our ultimate joy comes from Christ that dwells in us. We can rejoice this morning. Uh, we can rejoice today. We can rejoice every day. Why? Because we have been saved uh, by the grace of God. 
uh, I'm thankful to know and reminded that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, my friend, He has overcome death, hasn't He? Uh, he's overcome sin. Not only has He overcome death and sin, but Jesus is alive. And there is an empty tomb today, and that is why you and I can rejoice. Uh, if I would this morning, I'd like to take a, a message and a thought the Lord has given me today, and it being this, rejoice for He is risen. And uh, we're going to look this morning, if you would follow along with me, uh, all the scripture today that we're going to look at is going to be on the screen. So you've just got to look right there. It's right there this morning. Uh, if you're a note taker and you like to take notes, well, I encourage you this morning uh, to do so. Uh, you can write these scriptures down as we go through them. And I'm going to try to move through them this morning uh, at a good pace. And you, you're more than welcome to go back and read and study those in your own time through your daily devotion, daily uh, Bible study and prayer. But there's three things this morning uh, with Scripture today that I would like to look at. Uh, the first one, I'd like to look at the burial. Uh, Friday, we looked at the cross. Uh, this morning, first off, I'd like to look at the burial. Uh, the second one this morning we'd like to look at uh, is what we call the great lie. And we'll get on into that in just a minute. Uh, but then thirdly, this morning, I'd like like to look at the resurrection accounts according to the scripture that Jesus Christ, uh, my friend, that we can, that has been provided for us, that we know that Jesus Christ is alive and He is living today. And that He is seated at the right hand of God the Father, making intercession for you and for me. Amen? Uh, so the first one we want to look at this morning is the burial. And when you look at the burial, you're going to find in Matthew uh, chapter 27 and verses 57 through 66, the Bible says this as we look in Matthew 27 verse 57. It says, When the evening was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. And he went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, when he had, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone uh, over the door. And the Bible said of the sepulcher, which means the tomb, and departed. I believe right there that word departed, if you have that, if you want to write that word down or underline it in your Bible, that is a very important important word that Joseph of Arimathea, not only did he roll the stone over the opening of the tomb, but he left. He departed there as well. Now look at verse 60, uh, um, sorry, verse 61 says, and there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher or the tomb. So I want to stop right there for just a minute. And by looking at these verses today, uh, there's some things that the Bible teaches teaches us that stands out. Uh, when you go back to verse 57, uh, the Bible states here Matthew's account and his record of the gospel, it mentions that when evening was come. Now that's very important. If you were here Friday night, you'll know what we're talking about because in the book of Deuteronomy, it talks about uh, the one that is hanging upon the tree is a curse of God. But it also states in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 21 that my friend, that, that one that was hung up on the tree, that had died on the cross, their body was not to be left overnight, but it had to be taken down uh, the same day. Now, it's very important for us to understand uh, what he's talking about here. At evening time, Jesus, his body, had to be taken down off the cross before evening come. Now you say, preacher, why is that? Because the feast of Passover and the Sabbath day, the Sabbath began at evening. Now we know as from studying even this year that we know that the Jewish people, their calendar was different from our calendar. Uh, they had a different calendar. They had a different custom. They had a different manner in the way they went. And they went back to the book of Genesis 
because they believed uh, that God had set it up this way in creation. In Genesis chapter 1, we find that where God repeatedly for the next six or seven days said that in the evening and the morning was the first day. They believed that the evening, the day began at evening. So past, uh, the Sabbath day began on Friday evening. Now we find here that the body, it had to be taken down. So that's what Joseph of Arimathea did. He went. And he took the body down. Now, a few things about Joseph of Arimathea. Number one, he was a rich man. The scripture teaches there that he was rich. Not only that, but he was a disciple of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was a follower of Jesus. He was one that followed the Lord. He believed on Jesus. And my friend, he went and he began to beg for the body of Jesus before Pilate. Now, we find here that as he began to beg for the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, from Pilate, we find here that the Bible tells us that Pilate, gave the body of Christ to Joseph. He allowed that to happen and that's important. Uh, not only did he take the body but he wrapped it in fine and clean linen the Bible said and that he laid him in his own new tomb. Now this was the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. This was his own tomb as the Bible says that he hewn this tomb himself out of the rock. So Joseph took our Lord and and he laid him in his own tomb that he owned. And that's where he laid him. And we know not only that, but he rolled the stone over the door. And he left. He departed. Now that's very interesting. Uh, because what that teaches us this is Joseph of Arimathea did not hang around uh, by the tomb. No, he left. He departed. He went home. Now you say, why is that important? Well, my friend, it's important to know this, that Joseph of Arimathea left and departed and went home. And my friend, he was nowhere near uh, there around the tomb for day one, two, or three. Uh, but my friend, he left. Uh, and that proves to us that Jesus, my friend, truly resurrected from the dead uh, because Joseph uh, did not carry the body away or he did not take him and lay him in another tomb somewhere but my friend that was where he placed him and he rolled the stone over the door and he left and went home. So we find right here in Mark chapter 15, verses 42 and 47, and the Bible teaches us here in Mark chapter 15, 42 and 47, I want to kind of just go over what Mark teaches us there. It talks about the preparation day. And it said, now when the evening was come, because it was the preparation. The preparation day was the day before the Sabbath. And what they would do on this day, they would cook all their food, they would make all all preparation that they could before the Sabbath come because according to God's word and according to the law they were to do no kind of work they were not to do anything on the Sabbath but they were to rest and honor God for who he was because that's the way God had set it up and we find right here that they were they did all this they prepared everything but we find right here in this scripture that Joseph of Arimathea as we go to verse 43 we're going to find something uh, interesting about him it tells us that he is a honorable counselor now when you look at the CSV or the ESV or the New King James Version you're going to find here that they make this statement that he was a prominent member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, the New King James says that he's a prominent council member. The ESV says he was a respected member of the council. Now what is that telling us here? That Joseph of Arimathea was part of the religious council. He was part of those, my friend, that had, uh, my friend, had charged the Lord Jesus, had brought him up and delivered him to Pilate. But we're going to find out here in just a few minutes that Joseph had nothing to do with that. So we find not only in this verse, we find that there was another thing, that Joseph of Arimathea, he waited for the kingdom of God, or he looked for or looked forward to the coming kingdom of God. Not only that, my friend, we find that in the scriptures here in 44, we find that as, as he went before Pilate, 
and begin to ask him for the body of Jesus. The Bible said that Pilate marveled. Did you catch that right there? Uh, look at that. It said that Pilate marveled if he were already dead. And he calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been a while dead. So Pilate could not, uh, he was amazed, he was surprised that, that Joseph had come and asked him for the body because he couldn't believe that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was already dead. He marveled. But we find right here that once he called the centurion and he asked him and the centurion said, yes, he's been dead for quite a while. He is dead. What do we find right here? That we know that the Bible says in 45 and when he knew it talking of Pilate of the centurion he gave the body to Joseph that's important Pilate knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ was dead and he gave the body willingly to Joseph of Arimathea so we find that we also know that in this scripture that it's important to point out is that Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, beheld where he was laid. You see that? Now, that's important. You say, preacher, why is that important? Well, there's a theory, and we're going to look here in just a little bit. There's about 11 different theories that we know of, and this is one of the 11, that there are some people that believe, and the theory is out there, that these women on Resurrection Day went to the wrong tomb. They got mixed up and they went to the wrong tomb. But my friend, the Bible teaches us this morning and Scripture teaches us that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary and the other women, they knew exactly where the body of Jesus had been laid. They knew exactly the tomb that he was laying in because it said they beheld where he was laid. Look at Luke chapter 23, verses 50 and 56, and I'm going to just go through them this morning point out some things we find here that Joseph of Arimathea once again as I mentioned he was part of the Sanhedrin council he was part a prominent member but we find right here as the Bible says in 50 uh, it said uh, 50 go back to 50 it said behold there was a man named Joseph a counselor and he was a good man and just 51 says the same had not consented to the council and deed of them what was he talking about he was talking about the council of the Sanhedrin or the chief priests the religious leaders so we find right here he did not agree with their plan he did not go along with that plan so we find right here uh, once again in these scriptures that the women that came with Joseph of Arimathea from Galilee they beheld where the tomb was they laid eyes on it they seen where his body had been laid and not only that but the Bible said in verse 56 that they returned back to their home and they began to prepare spices and ointments and they rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment now quickly looking at the scripture in John this morning of John's account of Joseph of Arimathea and how he took the body of Jesus and he wrapped it in linen and he placed it in his own tomb. Now, the reason why you may be asking this morning, Preacher, why have you gone through all these verses in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and now in John? Well, it's important for us to know this because in all four Gospels, what it points to and what it is and what it records and what it teaches us is it shows consistency that Joseph of Arimathea was the one that prepared and took care of the body of Christ and laid him in the tomb and rolled the stone over the door but it also tells us that the women that were there they knew exactly where the tomb was and where Jesus had been buried and we find right only in John what we find about Nicodemus Nicodemus was there with the Lord as well this is the same Nicodemus in John chapter 3 that Jesus said for Nicodemus you must be born again he said, for to be able to see the kingdom of God, to be able to inherit the kingdom of God, he said, you must 
be born again. You and I, my friend, that, that, that have known Jesus, that have come to know Christ as our Lord and Savior, there is a regeneration that takes place. There's a new birth. We must be born again, as the Lord told Nicodemus. And my friend, if you're here today and you're lost and you've never been saved by God's amazing grace, you say, Preacher, how can I be born again? Well, Jesus said this, For that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit spirit he's talking about a spiritual birth my friend a regeneration a new birth that takes place in the heart and in the life of the believer the apostle Paul said that if any man be in Christ he's a new creature he said that old things have passed away but behold all things have become new I'm glad this morning as 11 year old boy I accepted Christ as my Savior and I became a new creature and a new creation in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that the old things had passed away, but behold, all things had become new. I want to look this morning on the second point, the great lie. Now, pay attention to this. You say, preacher, where in the world did you get this at? Well, look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 11 through 15. The Bible says now when they were going, this is right after... The women had been to the tomb. They had seen that the tomb was empty. The grave clothes were lying there. And that the angel of the Lord said, Jesus Christ is risen. He's not here. For he is alive. Uh, and he, and they, they, uh, they said in verse 11, Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch, which were the guards or the soldiers, came into the city and shoot unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while he slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. And it said, So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. So we find right here what this is called is the stolen body theory. Now this is real. This is what people really believe. Uh, there's 11 different one of these. Uh, the stolen body theory is the earliest theory that attempts to explain away the bodily resurrection of Jesus. There are 11 different theories, including the stolen body theory, that attempt to explain that there was no bodily resurrection of Jesus. I want to look right here at this scripture that we just read, and let's look for just a minute to find what the chief priest tried to do to explain away or cover up the real truth this morning. Number one, the Bible said that the chief priest assembled themselves together. They gathered together. They began to meet with the elders. Not only that, they took counsel. They come up with a plan. They said, how are we, what are we going to do? What are we going to say about this Jesus and the resurrection? So it said they gave the soldiers that were there that were standing watch they gave them a large amount of money man I tell you what money still takes care of a lot of things don't it huh to trying to cover up stuff right uh, he was going on way back then and it's still going on now but look what he said they gave the soldiers a large amount of money and they told the soldiers to say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept so they said, well, we want you guys to go tell a lie, and we're going to give you enough money to take care of this. They went on to say, the chief priest said, that if this comes to the governor's ears or Pilate's ears, that they would persuade him and secure him, that they would take care of it. So in other words, in our language today, they were saying, listen, we will deal with him and keep you out of trouble. Don't you worry about it. You just go on and tell this lie. But my friend, this morning, I want to look here at the resurrection and the accounts of the resurrection and I thought about this as we studied this week and prayed and even a couple weeks before for you and I that have been saved by God's amazing grace if someone that you are witnessing to or talking to or come in contact with if they was to ask you or if they was to say to you do you really believe in the resurrection of Jesus and you say, yes, I truly believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Would you be able to take them through God's word and give them facts and give them scripture and prove to them and show to them that Jesus Christ really 
dead arise from the grave. Well, that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to give you some scripture today that's going to help you in your witnessing and, my friend, to show that Jesus Christ truly is alive and alive forevermore. And I like the old hymn that we sang for you. Say, ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. For you and I that's been saved by God's grace, we understand the saving knowledge. We know the experience that Christ has done. We know the change and difference that he's made in our heart and in our life. We've experienced that. We know that. But for someone that's lost and has never been saved or born again, we ought to be able tonight today to take them through God's word and show them that Jesus and the resurrection is real. And I want to share that with you this morning very quickly. We look here. Uh, there's a couple of things I want to make mention of. Christianity this morning, it stands or falls with the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Did you get that this morning? Christianity stands or falls with the bodily resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection this morning is very important. You've got to have the birth. You've got to have the death. You've got to have the burial. But my friend, you've got to have the resurrection. You have to have it. Look at Matthew 28, verses 1 through 10. I'm just going to go through them really quick and make some points here. You can write these scriptures down and go home and study them in your own time. But Matthew 28, verses 1 through 10, we find here that Jesus, my friend, uh, he appeared to Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. We find just in this scripture, in the first couple of verses here, that we find that it was the end of the Sabbath. It was the first day of the week on Sunday. And Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, when they got to the tomb, there was a great earthquake that took place. And here's what they saw. The Bible said they saw the angel of the Lord descend from heaven. And it said that he came and he rolled back the stone from the door and he sat upon it. And the Bible said that those keepers, those ones that were there, those soldiers, those guards, it said that they fear. There was great fear that came upon them. And the Bible said that they became as dead men. But the angel said unto Mary and the other women, he said, Fear not, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen and here's what he said he said unto them he said come and see the place where the Lord lay and he said go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead these women got to see and behold with their eyes the first hand experience that the tomb was empty and they saw the risen Lord. Matthew chapter 28 verses 16 through 20 tells us that Jesus appeared to his disciples. The Bible tells us that Jesus appeared unto them in Galilee on a mountain that he had appointed or directed them to. We know that they saw him and they worshipped him. But the Bible says there were some there that doubted. Listen, there's always going to be doubters. As long as we're living on this earth, there's always going to be doubters. And even when you're witnessing or trying to tell someone about the resurrection and that it's true, you're still going to have people that will doubt the resurrection. But my friend, listen, give them the word of God. Give them the facts. Tell them, my friend, of what Jesus has done for you. Share with them your personal testimony in your own life. And that's all we can do. And leave the rest to God because God can go deeper than what you can go and I can go he can deal with the heart he can deal with their life he can show them he can open their eyes he can help them see that Jesus truly is the risen Savior amen look at this he said not only that but did they worship him some doubted but you know in Matthew chapter 28 verse 16 through 20 Jesus did something here he gave the disciples the great commission and here's what he told me he said you are to go and for you and I that have been saved by God's amazing grace, we have been commissioned as well today. We are to be a church that is a great commission church. We are to be a church that's on go. We are to be a people that's on go. And what did he tell them to do? He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and teach the nation, nations. I want you to make disciples out of the nations. And he said, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the Son and the Holy Spirit. And not only that, he said, but to teach them to observe or the Greek word there for observe means to 
guard the things that I've commanded you. And Jesus reminded them, he said, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Church, you and I that have been saved by God's grace, he's commissioned these disciples to go just like he's commissioned us to go. And we are to go beyond the four walls of this church and into our community and into our state and into our country and into international and to the nations, teaching and preaching and sharing about a risen Lord. When you look at Luke, I'm going to kind of just go through these scriptures if you want to write them down. I want to get to a close. Mark chapter 16, 1 through 8, 9 through 11, 12 through 14 teaches us there that he appeared to two and also the 11. Luke chapter 24, 1 through 12, 13 through 35, and 36 through 40 also has another account. And we find in John that, that he has an account as well where Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene and the 11 disciples. And not only that, but to close here in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, let's look at these scriptures. Here's what Luke, uh, the writer of Acts, began to share. He said this in Luke chapter 1, or Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, says, The former tree ties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, and to whom also he shewed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Three things right there that we can take away from those scripture. Number one it was he showed himself after his passion which was after the cross and after the resurrection. And by many infallible proofs, he showed himself, proved himself. Not only that, but they seen him for 40 days. They got to see the Lord. And not only that, but he spoke to them things concerning the kingdom of God. Coming to a close this morning, I want to leave you with a couple of points. First off is the resurrection is the fundamental doctrine of Christianity. Jesus did what no other person has ever done in all human history. Jesus was fully divine, which means fully God, and he was fully human. Jesus did what no other lowercase g here for God that has been worshipped and served could do or has done, and that is arise from the dead. Jesus' resurrection is not false, or as some people claim to be, a great hoax. It is not fiction or mythology this morning. It's not like Greek mythology and all the false that's there. But my friend, Jesus Christ and the resurrection is fact this morning. Not only that, but we look at this and how the disciples live the remainder of their lives. After the resurrection, we find the Bible teaches us not only the disciples... The 11, and then, the, of course, in the book of Acts, they ordained another one to make 12 in place of Judas. But we find the early church. Here's what happened. These disciples had a radical change in their lives. Their faith in Jesus Christ was incredible on how they lived. We find right here also throughout the Word of God that they had a real and genuine encounters with the risen Lord. We've looked at Scripture that will back that up this morning. Not only that, but we find that each disciple, except for the disciple of John, each died a death as a martyr. They died proclaiming Jesus as the risen Lord. You say, why is that important? Well, it's important because they seen that this not only was worth living their life for, but it was also worth dying for. And then lastly, the empty tomb and the grave clothes is enough this morning to prove that Jesus Christ is alive and he's living. The resurrection is real. I'm thankful this morning that we can rejoice in the resurrection of our Savior. I want to share this quick story with you. 
before we have a time of invitation. I read a story from a man by the name of Danny Aiken. He is the president of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's one of the Southern Baptist Convention seminaries that we support through the cooperative program. And he began to write and he shared this story about this man that he met many years ago and that he became friends with. And this man that he met considers himself an atheist or an agnostic. And as the way Danny explains it depends on what day of the week it is, whether he's an atheist or whether he's an agnostic. But what Danny began to share was this, is this man was very intelligent, he was very smart, and he was very curious. And that was what led him in 1990 to Dallas, Texas, where Danny Aiken was at at Criswell College, which is a Baptist college that Danny Aiken was there serving at. And this man came, and he wanted to live in an evangelical community, and he wanted to write about his experiences while living there. So this man, as he began to spend six months there at Chriswell College, he went to Bible studies. Not only did he go to Bible studies and Bible classes, he attended pastor's conferences. He went, even went on a mission trip, and he even went and observed a Southern Baptist Convention annual meeting. And after he had spent this time with Danny for six months, Danny invited him over to his house one evening right before he left, and he sat down with him after dinner. And he asked him, he said, after all this that you've seen, all your observation and what you've experienced, he said, tell me, what is the bottom line as you see it? And this is what this man's response was, was this. He said, as I see it with no hesitation, he responded, that is easy. That's easy. The way I see it is, is this. It's the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Not only that, he said, and if there is, if there is a God, if there is a God, and he is that God. He was saying, listen, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what it hinges on. That's the bottom line. And if there is truly a God out there, then that God is Jesus. He's the only one that can arise from the dead. He went on to say this, furthermore, not only that, but he said what this proves, the resurrection proves, is that the Bible is true because he, Jesus, said it was true and he believed it was true and that it is the very uh, spoken word of God. Not only that, but he went on to say this. He said that if the Bible's true and the Bible's real and the resurrection's real and there's truly a God, then surely that means there truly is a heaven and there's a hell. And if there's truly a heaven and there's truly a hell, he said then one's relationship with Jesus Christ is the deciding factor on which place you will spend eternity. That was an atheist and an agnostic. I want to say this morning, if everybody would, let's bow our head and close our eyes. If they want to come, get ready for a song, a time of invitation today. I'll say this this morning. Today, if you are sitting here and you've never surrendered your heart to Jesus Christ, and he's not your Lord and your King of kings and Lord of lords in your life, I want to encourage you today to call upon the name of Jesus. And it may just be something simple like this, Lord, I'm sorry. I know that, Lord, I've lived my own life. I've done my own desires. I've done my own things. I've done my own pleasures. I've done what I want to do. But, Lord, I have realized today that through the preaching of your word that I'm lost and I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. And, my friend, your prayer this morning just made be simply this. Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Cleanse me. Come into my life. Lord, I surrender my life today that for the rest of my days the rest of my life that I will live obedient and according to you maybe today you may just need to answer the call and the invitation as Jesus gave to his disciples as Peter James and John were out there fishing and as Jesus walked by the coast the sea of Galilee 
He called out to him and he said simply, Come, follow me, and I will make you fishermen of men. Won't you come today if Jesus is dealing with your heart and giving you that invitation to come, surrender your life to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We believe in the burial. We believe in the resurrection. And, Lord, we, we believe in the cross of Calvary today. We know the resurrection is real because your word says it is. Your word backs it up. It's truth. Lord, your word is the inerrant word of God. It is without uh, any kind of error. Lord, we pray this morning, Father, if there's someone here that's lost, that today would be the day they would surrender and believe and call on your name. Help us to take your word that you've given us this morning, apply it to our life, that, Lord, we may use it to be a help and a strength as we witness and as we are a great commission church and a church on go for you, as we spread the gospel to a lost and dying world, God, you have give us your word this morning that we can back up and know and show and tell somebody that the resurrection is real. We love you and all this we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. As you stand to your feet this morning, the altar is open. If you feel the need to come and pray, we encourage you to do so today as they sing. Appreciate that this morning. Thank the Lord. I'm reminded by that scripture when Jesus did appear to his 11 disciples. And uh, we know the story about Thomas, how Thomas doubted. And he said, Lord, I, I'm not going to believe unless I can see your hands and your feet and your side. I can place my hand in that nail-scarred hand. And we know that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he appeared to Thomas. And he allowed Thomas to see those uh, nail scars. And he placed his hand in those nail scars. He even allowed him to see his side and his feet. But he also told uh, Thomas something. He said, Thomas, he said, Blessed are those that have not seen and still believe. And I tell you what, I'm among those this morning. Uh, I've not truly physically laid my eyes upon the Lord Jesus and saw him and placed my hand in the nail scarred hand. But I can tell you this, with all my heart this morning, I believe and I have faith that Jesus died on the cross and he arose the third and glorious day. He ascended back to God the Father. He's sitting there this morning making intercession for you and I. Uh, I'm thankful for the greatest gift that's ever been given to mankind, and that is Jesus and the gift of salvation. Anybody this morning have a testimony or a word, anything on your heart you feel led to say today before we uh, dismiss in a word of prayer?
Amen. Sure would. Amen. It shall you shall be saved. Amen. Appreciate that. Anybody else? Well, it certainly has been a joy to be here in God's house today. And if you've enjoyed being here, say amen this morning. Amen. I appreciate everybody that's come to be with us. And don't forget, if you are visiting with us, uh, we're so thankful that you've come. We hope and pray you'll come back and be with us Wednesday night and then next Sunday morning as well. And uh, if you would, take just a few minutes and fill out the guest card. And uh, you can place that in the offering plate as you go out the door this morning. I am going to ask a couple of our deacons if they would come this morning and uh, go back by the door and stand with the offering plate. Uh, I believe Autumn and Hannah have a little something there that's going to tie the young men up. So, Hannah, do you, or Autumn, you want to say anything about that? Keep that in mind, and Hannah's standing back there as well, so remember that. Well, Let's definitely remember that. Remember the uh, WMU and that meeting on Thursday night at 7. And uh, we do encourage everybody that can and will uh, to come be a part of that. You don't have to be a lady. You don't have to be in WMU. Uh, and, and Brother Bob Zevateri is going to be here to speak and preach. And uh, Bob's a wonderful man. I thank the Lord for him. I love him. And he has a wonderful testimony. He is a converted Catholic. And uh, so he has a wonderful testimony about what Jesus has done in his life. So uh, we encourage you to come be a part of that and uh, remember that service and prayer. And as Sheila said about the BCM uh, Baptist Collegiate Ministry there at UT, remember that. All righty. No one else has anything. All right. I hope and pray that everybody has a good rest of the day and enjoy uh, the day that you can and uh, just rejoice in our risen Lord. Amen. And uh, thank the Lord for what he has done for us. Uh, I'm going to ask Brother Kyle if he would dismiss us this morning in prayer.